order of business is connecting a, a second display to this uh, OpenBSD installation. <laughs> and, um, Is the microphone on? Yes. Great. Are you getting any video output? Nothing? Maybe I should boot the laptop. Yep. While we're waiting, everyone who's on IRC but doesn't know about uh, our IRC channel, we have a channel on OFTC uh -huh. called DKNOG. <laughs> Can you flip the screen? Fantastic. I'm confused. All right. We will do the backup plan. So the backup plan is a different Unix, namely iOS. Are you getting any output? Okay, I can already see this is all <laughs> also not the best plan. Um, yeah, that would be great.
this work? Almost. No, that's not that though. Hello? Is that you? I don't see you. And I just downloaded the new one. <coughs> Perfect. Fantastic. Thank you for your help. So a word of wisdom here. If you bring your own laptop, test it before you go on stage. And as an organization, if you have presenter laptops, that's even more awesome. So uh, I want to talk to you today. Turn up or off? Is this better, Arnold? All right. Um, I'm Job Snyders. I work for NTT Communications, a transit provider, and we use the internet routing registries in, uh, uh, to provision our systems. And today I want to talk about what this internet routing registry mechanism is, how it works, how tools interact with it, and what the caveats are. Because this is not as straightforward uh, as one would hope it to be. Um, and I'll also pitch some new ideas to use uh, different data sources, like the RPKI or Erin who is. There are many ways to make prefix lists, and, and we'll cover some of them uh, in this presentation. The way we do filtering, uh, what I would recommend everyone to do uh, today, is we have BGP routing policies associated with every eBGP neighbor there is on the network. And in each of these policies, we go through a number of, let's call it pruning steps, to ensure that what we accept is actually proper and correct announcements. So step one is we reject RFC 1918 space, the private space. On the public internet, private space has no place. So that one is obvious. We also reject uh, uh, BGP announcements that have a private ASN anywhere in the AS path. The reason is that private ASNs are not assigned to organizations. So from an accountability perspective, it is very important to ensure that the whole BGP path actually uh, is represented by real organizations that you can call uh, or email if need be. We uh, reject IXP peering land prefixes of the IXPs we are connected to. The reason is that um, the moment you accept uh, more specific of a peering land prefix, it can cause uh, great problems for uh, people if you distribute that more specific. Some BGP implementations will start sending the BGP packets towards the more specific rather than the directly connected interface. So peering land prefixes are a special case. Um, then we have what we call peer lock. That's a, a, a quite an advanced mechanism that is a whole presentation in itself, and we'll skip over that today. But the basic premise of peer lock is that it's an AS path-based filter where we would reject 
receiving routes from our peers via other peering partners. So for instance, we should never accept prefixes that level three announce to Cogent and then Cogent in turn announces to us. That should not occur, that's a routing leak. And these filters help against such routing leaks. So over, after a long list of rejecting stuff, then we finally arrive at what is the more interesting part. Um, we allow prefixes that are registered in the IR or in who is, and perhaps maybe in the future, our PKI can also play a role. Then whatever is not part of the whitelist is rejected. So what is this IRR thing? For us, it's a, a public database source that we use to generate our prefix-based uh, prefix filters. IRRs are publicly accessible, and this aids debugging both for the NTT NOC, but also the customers. So customers themselves can inspect what would end up in NTT's filters. Uh, and I think this transparency is very important because it's a public resource, the internet. And if I cannot see the same things as you can see, uh, it, it greatly com uh, complicates things. So the IRR is actually a collection of many databases. Um, many of the RARs have their own IRR database. And you can already sense that this is a fantastic tongue-twisting combination to have an IRR from an RAR and it becomes a letter salad. Um, but, but RIPE, APNIC, ARIN, AFRINIC uh, offer IRR services themselves. Then there are also other IRR sources, which are operated by, by what we call third parties. These IRR databases um, are, for instance, uh, operated by NTT or RADB or uh, LTDB. Uh, there are quite some third party databases out there. Uh, I know of roughly 40 databases, but NTT only considers 14 out of the 40 as relevant sources. Not all these sources are equal. Many of them operate on their very different rules compared to each other, and this, this is a, a source of confusion for many people. But before we dive into the differences between the IRRs, let's take a, a deep dive into what the IRR database actually is. The atom of an IRR database is the route object. The route object is a snippet of text uh, when you query it via a CLI to like who is. Um, in this example, uh, this is uh, the prefix I use at my home, and only two pieces are relevant out of the route object. There's the prefix itself, 192.147.168 slash 24, and the origin. And all the other stuff like description, notify, maintained by, changed, the prefix generation software does not consider that input at all. It just looks at the tuple of prefix, comma, origin ASM. So if I want to generate a list of prefixes for which AS15562 is uh, authorized to announce them. And this, this authorized is uh, something, uh, it's perhaps not the correct word. The, a better word is just, if I want to look at a list of prefixes where the route object suggests that AS15562 maybe is allowed to announce the prefix, uh, I can issue this very easy and straightforward, easy to remember command. Um, what we see here is uh, the who is command. Who is, by the way, is a dead simple protocol. And that makes it beautiful and horrible at the same time. All you do with who is is you send a command to a server, which ends in a new line. And then the server may or may not give you a reply. And the command and, and the answer None of that is structured whatsoever. Each WIS service has its own protocol, uh, and it's, it's not... So this is from a time way, way, way before JSON and XML and YAML. This is, you know, from the 80s. <laughs> um, so what is happening on the screen right now, I sent a command, exclamation mark G, which stands for uh, a reverse lookup to give me all the prefixes, where the origin AS is 15562, and I get an answer back. The answer first starts uh, by listing 
how many bytes will follow, <laughs> and then bytes follow, namely uh, white space separated uh, prefixes, and then the connection closes because the command was successful. And you see that the prefix I showed in the prefix ex example, this route object, appears in this search result uh, because the origin is 15562. Uh, this is the same data, but very different output. Uh, there is an open source tool called BGP Q3. It's a, a, a very nice open source project that can be used to generate prefix filters for uh, Juniper, iOS XR, BERT, OpenBGPD, iOS, uh, it, and it can even output JSON. Um, so this is something that network engineers would actually use in their own environments because you know, it, it would be ridiculous to use whois commands to feed into your router configs. You would use a real tool uh, that does the proper structuring for you. But we see the same commands. I, I use the rr.ntt.net uh, IRD instance. I send it, uh, I query it for AS15562, and I get output, and amongst the output is the prefix we saw as the route object. Of course, it's not pragmatic to do this only on an AS level because people resell services. I may have a customer who has a customer who has a customer. And to do such grouping of AS, uh, ASNs, there's a concept called AS set. Here we see an example of an AS set. The name of the AS set is AS15562 colon AS Snyders. The reason I use the format uh, AS number colon name uh, is because this guarantees that the set is unique. Nobody will have the same name um, as this particular object because I am the only one that has this AS number. It's globally unique. And as part of the AS set output, we see members. And members can be either an AS number or another AS set, like AS King or AS Nether. Uh, and you can sense that there will be a, a bit of recursion here. So what the machinery does under uh, the hood? Uh, I can demonstrate again with a whois command what is actually happening uh, on a, a software level. Uh, a command is sent to the IRRD instance, exclamation mark I. Uh, then the name of the AS set follows, comma one. And the comma one means do this recursively, and exclamation mark I uh, means expand this AS set into its members. The answer I get in this case is 130 bytes, and what follows is white space delimited list of AS numbers, and then the connection closes. Uh, to, to give a different perspective on how AS sets are actually structured, because you can have the recursion, because you, you can have infinite depth where um, an AS set references an AS set that references an AS set, at so, and so forth. Uh, I've wrote a small Python script called IRR3. You can find it on GitHub. And if you give IRR3 uh, as a parameter the name of the AS set, AS15562 colon AS Snyders, it gives you a textual output of how what is including what in this particular AS set. And this, this can help you better understand your own AS set and the AS sets of your customers. So to wrap this up, what the machinery does is when a customer tells us this is my AS set, our software will query the Whois server for, I cannot read that, man. Oh, OK. <laughs> the, so you send a command to the, the IRD instance saying, Give me a list of all the ASNs that are part of this AS set. And then per AS number, you do again a query where you say, give me a list of all the prefixes that belong to this AS. So an AS set that has, say, 15 members actually is 16 queries under the hood to generate the list of prefixes. Um, and then, of course, the list is deduplicated, and maybe you mangle it uh, a little bit because maybe you will uh, allow up to slash 24 uh, as a convenience to your customers. Uh, then you transpose that into actual router configs. And, and to do all of this, 
the shortcut is just use BGP Q3 um, to, to get the desired output. And ordering matters. I already mentioned that there are 40 IRR database. Out of the 40, NTT chose to only use 14 of those. Uh, and the order of those matters. Because what happens if there is a duplicate AS set name? What if AS Stealth exists both in RADB and in the RIPE database? Um, the interesting story about this particular AS set is that the duplication uh, was caused by two different organizations. The organization that has the object in RIPE has nothing to do with the object that exists in RADB. So our provisioning software allows us to um, specify the order in which the sources must be queried. And um, another way of querying this would be um, to, to send our IRD instance, the easy to remember command, exclamation mark J dash asterisk. <laughs> very, very intuitive. Uh, and that gives you a list of the IRR databases we are mirroring and it shows the order in which we will expand AS sets. This is an example of why the ordering matters. In the case of AS Stealth, if we use the AS set that exists in the RIPE database as the starting point, and then uh, iteratively go through other IRRs, we arrive at a list of 175 prefixes. If we flip the order, and start with the one that exists in RADB and then proceed with RIPE, we arrive at a list that is uh, almost 1,500 prefixes. So this, of course, is, is very, very annoying to troubleshoot. And anybody that is generating filters today uh, should be aware of ordering and should allow their systems to specify the order in which things happen. The obvious remedy for end users is to avoid duplicate names. If you notice that somebody already has that AS set name in some database, do not use it yourself. Use the format where you use your AS number, colon, the name of the AS set. That way there will not be duplication. Um, in this case, it seems that both organizations are a little bit stubborn and neither of them wants to give up their name. So this is what it is. Uh, and there are many more examples. I mean, there are many companies that call themselves internet services. And there is a company that exists in the Netherlands that is called that way, but there is also one in Africa. And of course, one has AS-IS in the RIPE database, the other one has AS-IS in, in the Afrinic database. Um, so this, this is a real risk that, that can have impact on your business because what you should also consider Maybe today there is not a duplication of your AS set, but there could be tomorrow. And you, you, the moment you notice, it may be already be too late. So it would be good to make an inventory of what your AS set name is today and whether you should convert it to the other format where you prepend it with your AS number. So let's dive into why the IRRs are not equal. Um, IRs differ in terms of ownership. Some are community projects, some are part of a corporation that exists for commercial purposes, some exist uh, because they are part of an IR, RARs uh, services. Uh, the purpose of IRs can differ. Some of them are for the general public to use, and some of them only contain data that is relevant to the company that operates it. But regardless, all of IRR is a garbage in, garbage out system. There is nothing clever in any of the mechanics of this. Whatever you submit uh, is what you will fetch if you send the commands that I showed in the earlier slides. Uh, some RERs have excellent training material. For instance, the RIPE is really leading in this space. They have online webinars. There's pretty decent documentation. They fly around the world to teach people how to use the RIPE database. But not all RERs do this. And I think you can also see this in the quality of the data where you know, the less knowledge distribution occurs, then the less the quality of the data is. So 
let's, let's go over some real differences. And I don't expect you to memorize these by heart, but they are in the slides. The slides will be on the website, so you can reference it in the future. In the NTTCOM database, the second largest routing registry on the planet, uh, any customer of NTT can create any route object for any prefix that doesn't exist yet. RADB, similar. If you pay them $500 a year, you can create any route object for any prefix if the prefix doesn't exist yet. So you can sense that there is very little actual verification whether the creator of the route object is in any way associated with the owner of the prefix. So this is problematic. It's, uh, it's very uh, convenient on one hand because there are no checks. On the other hand, it's very dangerous because there are no checks. Then there is an IRR operated by an RER, the ARIN IRR. And any member of ARIN can create any route object for any prefix if it's not yet covered by another route object. So again, very little checking. There is no checking almost. So anyone can create uh, route objects in the ARIN database for our European prefixes. That's not good news. In the ARIN WHOIS database, which is yet another database, uh, only the owner of an IP block can specify the appropriate origin ASN. Um, so there are two databases in the ARIN region, and they have very different meaning, different semantics, and different authorization model. In the right database, and this is one of the most complex ones, only the owner of an IP block can create or designate uh, uh, route objects, except when it's not ripe managed space. So IANA gave a bunch of slash aids to ripe, and it's ripe's purpose to distribute pieces of those slash aids to us as uh, end users. Uh, so those slash aids are very well protected in the sense that only the owner of the prefix can actually influence uh, the route objects. However, if we talk about slash aids that, for instance, were handed to Aaron or Afrinic or APNIC, you can just uh, register any route object you want in the RIPE database. So this is crazy. So in the RIPE database, you have data that is authoritative, as it's called, which is very trustworthy, reliable, and there is data that is not reliable at all, that could come from anywhere. Uh, and this, of course, is a source of permanent confusion, and this is abused by people. Uh, there are many well-known uh, cases where spammers would register Afrinix space in the RIPE database. Uh, that makes it uh, be, become a part of the whitelist of the transit providers. So, the next, so they create a router object today. Tomorrow, the filters are updated. And then they start spamming the bejeebus out of those uh, hijacked uh, prefixes. And then a day later, all the evidence disappears again. Fortunately enough, this uh, weakness has been identified. And the database working group in the RIPE region came to a consensus that this is not a desired mode of operation. So what will happen in the future, uh, later, later this year, is that route objects that are um, following the chain of trust, you know, from IANA, it was designated to RIPE, and from RIPE, it was designated to uh, the end user. Uh, those will be marked with source colon RIPE. And the objects that where there was no verification whether the owner actually wanted those objects to exist, they will be marked with source colon RIPE dash non off. And non off is short for non authoritative. And this way, uh, People that investigate abuse can very easily see, hey, there was abuse from this prefix. This prefix was registered in the RIPE database, and it was marked as non-authoritative. So we know that is uh, potentially garbage. Um, another interesting difference. In the RIPE database, as it is today, when you want to create a route object, both the owner of the prefix and the owner of the AS number have to approve the creation of that route object. If the maintainer on the uh, OTNAM and on the route object are the same, then it's easy. Then with a single password 
or uh, if you use the web interface, uh, uh, the, the object will be created. But if we have the curious case where, for instance, I am the owner of a prefix, and I want NTT to announce it on my behalf, that's the service I buy from them, then um, NTT has to approve the creation of the route object, and I have to approve creation of the route object. And you can see that this is a complicated process, a complicated dance uh, for all parties involved, especially if NTT's ASM is not part of the write database, but part of the ARIN database, then the whole model becomes very uh, confusing. Fortunately, this will change. Uh, later this year, only the owner of the prefix will need to approve uh, creation of route objects. And this aligns the behavior of the RIPE database with uh, all other IRR databases, like for instance, APNIC, um, and it aligns with the RPKI model. In the RPKI model, people realize that only the owner of a prefix is the relevant party, and if the owner chooses to authorize any AS number, that's up to them. There should not be any restrictions. Um, then we have the APNIC and AFRINIC databases, which have yet different policies. Um, in the APNIC database, you can only create route objects for space that is managed by APNIC itself. So you cannot create route objects that cover ARIN space or RIPE space or AFRINIC space in the APNIC database. And this is awesome, because that means that their database has the cleanest data. All the data in that database has been created by owners of the prefix. Uh, so it's reliable, it's trustworthy, it's coupled to route object creation, is coupled to ownership, and all route objects are managed, uh, uh, fall under APNIC managed space. So this, this is the best approach you can have, and I'm happy to see uh, RIPE move in the same direction. But the summary of all of this, all of these differences is what the, all right. A, um, what is this Aaron who is thing that you may have seen me email about? Aaron has had the IRR database for a long time, uh, but next to that they have a who is database. And there's no coupling between the who is database and the IRR database. And in the who is database, you can also input what origin ASN belongs uh, to certain prefixes. So, the, the cool thing about Aaron who is compared to the Aaron IRR is that the who is database is actually tied to the owner of the prefix. Uh, so it is a trustworthy authoritative source of data. Uh, and what we do today is we download the entire Aaron who is database. That's roughly 3.5 gigabytes of XML. Then we use regular expressions to convert the XML into route objects. Uh, some of you may cringe at the thought of parsing XML with regular expressions, but uh, it's the fastest way to do this. <laughs> uh, and those route objects are then loaded into the rr.ntt.net uh, IRD instance. And this way we can tell customers, hey, you can either register a route object or you can uh, register um, in the Whois database. And this would be an example of uh, such an object that came from Whois data was converted into IRR format and then presented uh, in the daemon. Um, so all of this machinery runs at specific times. Um, at 1 a.m. we will generate all the config snippets that must be loaded onto the routers. At 4 a.m. UTC we actually load those uh, prefixes on the routers. And the reason there's a gap between generating and loading onto the network is that long ago, um, there once was an incident where NTT pushed empty prefix lists to all the routers and that took offline the entire network. And there were some customers that thought that was not a great idea. Um, so this way, there is always a human that can verify that the generation step actually uh, made sense and then it can go on to uh, the next step, which is actually deploying. Um, all of these data sets are loaded into irrexplorer.nlnoc.net. This is a tool that should give you more insight in how your AS sets are structured, what route objects exist for uh, which of your prefixes. For instance, 
you may think that there is a route object only in the ripe database, but in reality, maybe someone else made a route object in some other database long ago. Uh, and especially in the time where IP trading is becoming more and more common, it is of particular interest to verify that the IP block you are buying actually is cleaned up and all the IRR entries in other databases are removed. Um, let's talk a little bit about RPKI. We know RPKI as the thing where you can create a ROA. A ROA is sort of a route object, but the meaning of the fields are very different compared to route objects. Um, but it has the characteristics that we are looking for, namely a prefix and an origin AS. And that's the data combination we use in all these processes. Uh, we also know with the RPKI that only the owner of a prefix can create these ROAS. So it's very trustworthy data compared to IRR. Um, I created a ROA for my um, um, IPv6 block. Uh, there's many ways to access uh, RPKI data. You can install a, a validator, as it's called, yourself, which will work with the system to download data, verify it cryptographically, and then uh, make it available to you in some computer parsable format. Uh, or you can use a hosted um, uh, validator instance. The point is, this data is cryptographically verifiable. It can only be created by the owner, so it's really high quality data. So I've wrote a simple command line uh, 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 one-liner uh, where we take the JSON dump from uh, the hosted validator on RIPE's uh, surfaces. We pass it through uh, a command line tool called J. Q, which is a, a JSON parser. Uh, we do some magic here. In a, yeah, I always need the manual when working the, with this tool because I cannot memorize any of these commands. Um, and then the output is the prefix for which we previously saw the ROA. This prefix, uh, as it appears here, this CLI output is the same data. Uh, I've implemented using RPKI as route objects in one network, uh, in a hobby network, and I think it would be uh, worth considering doing this also uh, on, on the carrier side of things, in, for instance, NTT's network or other networks. Um, a small tool to facilitate working with RPKI data is called RTR-SUP. What RTR-SUP does, it takes the JSON uh, output from a validator uh, it mangles it through a template, and then uh, you can output it in any format that is useful for you. Uh, for instance, iOS or BERT output. Um, I need two more minutes. Deal? Okay. So future work in this area, because what we've seen so far is really, really old technology. Uh, and it's not, I don't think it belongs in this day and age to, to still be working on, on this level with who is protocols, etc. cetera. Um, so one of the goals NTT has uh, for, for this year is to rewrite IRRD from scratch in a modern language. Uh, IRRD version 3 is a, a collection of C and C++, and it's, it's utter spaghetti code. Uh, it was written by amateurs, uh, uh, from uh, you know, first-year students, but then made worse by the likes of me. Um, and, and we cannot innovate on that framework uh, that was, was created uh, starting 20 years ago and organically grew in, into the monster it is today. So we just delete that, start from scratch with a Python-based, uh, uh, Django-based uh, application, and then we can innovate. Then we have an option to have third parties, for instance, do verification against RAR API endpoints. And that is something we cannot do today, but maybe in the future uh, uh, we can do such things. And another thing, RPKI has no equivalent of AS sets, but AS sets are very important because how else do we group information about I have a customer, who has a customer, who has a customer? And I think we need an equivalent of that. So that means going to ITF put on my sandals, I'm growing my beard, as you can see, uh, and I'll take that discussion there. So this concludes uh, the IRR talk. Um, of course, I will steal this precious stage time to promote my own event, the NLNOC camp, June uh, 1st to 3rd in the Netherlands, will be uh, camping with BGP. So consider putting this in your agenda. 
and flying to the Netherlands. It's just a one hour flight. Um, so, any questions? No questions? Oh, wait. <laughs> I realize I've been loading a ton of data uh, into your heads, so uh, if you have questions later, you can always email me. You go first, then. Th this, is a, th this is rather a comment, vaguely disguised as a question. Thank you very much for, for being the garbage man of the internet and trying to <laughs> clean up this mess, because <laughs> it, it is a mess. So, so thank you um, and for putting up, uh, exchanging your clocks with the sandals and going to the IETF to fix this. Thank you. Yeah, Arnold here. <coughs> Job, first thank you for the presentation. Um, regarding the naming of our assets, you said, uh, please name them your IS, Colin, and then any name, and then you can be sure that it will be unique, but anyone could use your IS also or not. Um, what you say is partially true, uh, but for instance, in the right database, you cannot create uh, AS set names that start with my ASM because you would need my permission, my authorization to uh, create that in the right database. If you would create a copy in one of the third party databases, uh, then yes. So uh, the name collision avoidance trick is not one that is cryptographically verifiable, but it is one that in practice leads to unique names. And what I try to say is we should avoid accidental collisions, and you can avoid accidental collisions by prepending it with your ASN number, uh, but malicious collisions are an entirely different story. And we should realize that all of this IRR stuff is built on trust, because way back when, people are like, you know, surely nobody's gonna abuse this, that, that'd be crazy. Fast forward 20 years, like, ah. and And this is why I think uh, RPKI, uh, can have, uh, let me see. Uh, so AS sets in RPKI could truly be unique, cryptographically verifiable, uh, uh, without any collisions, um, because with RPKI, everything flows from the owner of a resource to the actual uh, data that is used in uh, uh, routing decisions. And I think using AS sets in RPKI is our one shot at getting uh, avoiding the problem you mentioned of uh, either malicious or accidental collisions. But until then, we have to make do with what we have. Just time for a very short one. Um, as far as I understood, you said I RPK might, might uh, solve the issue, but there are several uh, databases, so how do they coordinate that the namespace will be unique? Um, there are several RPKI root certificates, five of them to be precise. Each root certificate is managed by uh, an RAR, and the RARs amongst themselves ensure that there is no collision. So for instance, AS15562, my ASM, is managed by RIPE. So from RIPE's root certificate, uh, the trust can flow uh, downwards. If I migrate my ASM from RIPE to APNIC, for instance, uh, then you get a complicated dance, and the, uh, yeah, that's, that's a whole different presentation. But the RERs are the ones that coordinate amongst themselves just with IP prefixes. IP prefixes are globally unique because the RERs work together to ensure they're not assigning the same space. Any more questions? I like running over time. <laughs> We're going to take this from the uh, cake time. And we only have seven, min seven minutes for cake now. <laughs> <laughs> um, I was just wondering um, why, when, when you're taking all these different databases, why would you take root objects from any other database from the one from the rear who assigned the network? Um, well, there's so much history. There's like 20 years of, of garbage in, garbage out. Um, uh, some RERs made it, you know, we're, we're really popularizing uh, uh, making route objects and making sure that they are correct. 
In some regions of the world, uh, the whole IR thing is sort of an afterthought. People don't consider it important. And um, they're, 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 for instance, RADB is older than the ARIN IRR. So in North America, people already started out by using a third party IRR instead of using the, the RAR's IRR. So for historic reasons, many people are, are working on a different database than the one from the RAR. Another example, uh, the LACNIC region does not have an IRR at all. So the only IRRs that exist in, in South America are third party IRRs. So this, all of this is a mess. <laughs> And that's the end of the questions, actually. OK. You, you can catch them outside. And uh, we have to be back here in seven minutes. So you, you can go grab some cake.